So we're, we're in our series, which is really fitting for us. And that, that series is, is living your best life because we all want to live a good life. We all want to, to live the best life. And it's something that is, is particularly on our minds this time of year. So I'm going to ask by, let's see, today is the 19th, a very unpopular question at this time. And that is, what was your New Year's resolution and how's it going? Because statistics say that most people that make a resolution have completely bombed it by this point in time, other than the 2% of you, which we all hate you, are doing well right now. So if you are one of those people, don't tell us how you're doing and that you're doing great because we're not going to be happy with you. But that's kind of the idea. We want to live our best life. And the idea of a New Year's resolution is, well, last year was, most of us would say, well, pretty good. But with just a few minor modifications, just a couple of adjustments, my life can be great. I can fix the the areas through this self-improvement project that are going wrong, and I can have a great life life. But I want to push a little bit deeper. I want to challenge you to ask the the bigger question, the question that's behind that, and that question is, is what is, what is our community's definition of blessedness? And okay, maybe we won't use that pious of a word, but what would we describe as the good life? What would we describe as success? What would, the, what would be the thing, the picture that we would paint and say, all right, now I know I've made it. Now I know I've got it. Now everything's together. Everything's good. My life is great. And I'm still trying to, to get to know Rockland a little bit. But I could tell you what it was in Orange County. In Orange County, it was driving the nice car. It was having the big house being very successful in business and all the time wearing a pair of sandals and a Hawaiian shirt, pretending like it's easy. When you're working 65, 70 hours a week, killing yourself, because that's the ideal. You, you got to pretend like you're doing it easy and that everything just comes naturally. You're just catching the wave, man. That was Orange County. What is it here? Maybe it's this picture with a few more mountains, a little bit of snow. What is success? What is the good life? And certainly there's nothing wrong with enjoying creation and being in the mountains or hitting the beach, as we know Pastor Brad is want to do. But what's the definition that says to us, okay, I've got it. I've got that thing that I want, that I I need. And what I want to challenge you is that thing that you think is the thing that you want, that you need, that you have to have, the thing that you made resolutions in order to get to. It just might not be the thing that you're looking for. Because what this world calls blessedness, the, the good life, success. I don't, I don't think that it's all that it's cracked up to be. See, my experience, and, and this is hard, is that real blessedness, not what the world would call blessedness, wealth and power, being famous, successful, beautiful, enviable, what the world would call blessedness, isn't all that we think it is. Not that those things are bad, but what I have found in my life is that real blessing, real blessing comes in unexpected packages. I'm going to show you a video clip, and this was when Elise was about, I think about 12, 14 months old. And I'll explain more of it later, but uh, just, uh, just a little something to, to get you thinking about what real blessing is. Uh-oh, we need volume on this. We got volume? It's 11 seconds, so we can watch it again. And she's little and cute, so it's all right.
Okay, maybe it's not going to work this service. That's all right. We've, I think we've gone about 33 seconds now. Watch it three times. Anyways, my wife sneezes, and she says, bless you. And it's cute, and it's adorable, and maybe I'll put it up on Facebook later, and you can come check it out. Um, but there was something else going on in that picture, uh, something else that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. You know, real blessing, I think, comes in weakness. See, what Jesus teaches is something entirely different. He teaches an inversion of the kingdom, the, the kingdom of this world that says that all that there is, all that you can see and hold and have and buy and control, he says that weakness comes in blessing. A blessing comes to us from someone who is greater to someone who is weaker. We are, we are blessed not because we deserve it, but because of how someone looks on us and chooses us and favors us. And as I thought about this series, we're right now looking at Matthew chapter 5. In particular, the Beatitudes. It's part of Jesus' longest uh, sermon that is recorded, the Sermon on the Mount. And I had to feel a little bit intimidated about this because this section of Scripture has had more ink spilled on it than any other part of Scripture. And if you were to do a survey of the entire Bible, you would probably find that there has been more controversy and more disagreement and more argument and more writing about this two chapters from the book of Matthew than any other Scripture. And part of that is, is that as Jesus comes to the mount, some people have said that, all right, as Jesus comes to the mount, Jesus by Matthew is being written in as a, a greater Moses. And so as Jesus comes up onto the mountain to teach, the, some of the scholars are saying what they want you to see is that Jesus is ascending the mountain and he's coming as a, as a new Moses. Yet others aren't convinced. And some would say that as Jesus ascends the mount, he's not coming as Moses, but as the true son of David, the saving son of God, a, a guy that has started his ministry and acted graciously and with mercy. And now he gathers the crowds around him and his disciples come to him and he begins to speak. And here, his first sermon, his first big words on the scene are words of power and might and grace. From Matthew chapter 5. Now when the crowds, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach. And he said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And the question is, what is meek? We don't really know what to do with that word, and I frankly didn't either, because it all hangs on that word and what that merged. So first I went to the dictionary and found out that it said this. Meek, quiet, gentle, and easily opposed upon submissive. I used to call her Miss Mouse because she was so meek and mild. Do you think that's what Jesus is saying here? And then there's some good Christians that I think got a hold of Wikipedia because this is what Wikipedia had to say. Meekness is an attribute of human nature and behavior. It has been defined several ways. Righteous, humble, teachable, and patient under suffering. Long-suffering, willing to follow gospel teachings, an attribute of a true disciple. Yeah, I think some good Christians got a hold of that one. And I don't think they're quite right either. Because if what that is saying is true, then this picture is what it's saying. That meekness is not weakness, it's strength under control. I'm choosing to be meek, I'm choosing to be submissive. But I think that would put us in a position where we'd have to read the Beatitudes wrong. We'd be reading the Beatitudes like Jesus is our genie. And if we just do the right things, we can get something from him. If we just become meek, then we're really going to get what we want. And to tell you the truth, that's kind of the sermon that I wanted to preach. Because it does ring true of other parts of Scripture. Because we are, as followers of Jesus, called to be humble. 
we heard that word meek, we hear that word humble, we think of Jesus where Paul describes him in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. See, that's when meekness, I think, the thing that triggers in our mind. We want to read this in Christianese and say, this is what it's talking about, because if I am meek enough, if I'm humble enough, if I'm low enough, then God's going to look with favor on me. But that's not much of a blessing, is it? It's kind of a terrible blessing. Like, you got to work your way down in order to go up. Man, that sucks. Because you never really know if you've made it low enough. Right? Especially if Jesus is the standard. <laughs> Come on. Oh, man. So what is Jesus talking about? See, that sort of definition of meekness is an active definition of meekness. It's about trying to avoid hubris, which is good. It's about being humble. It's about being gentle. Things that Paul talks about the Christians and says, you should be these things. Be those things. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. See, when Jesus begins to preach this sermon, he's beginning to preach this sermon. His first words on the scene are calling from allusions from the Old Testament. Things that the people of God, the, the Jewish people, the people that he's preaching to have been hearing and so when he says these words, he's calling to mind Psalm 37. Psalm 37 that says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Does that sound familiar? These are words that, that Jesus just said. He's, he's talking about a, a gift, something that's, that's given and to take it a little further, Jesus' first beatitude, blessed are in the poor in spirit, that calls to mind Psalm 61. Psalm 61, one of the great servant psalms. Not psalms. The great servant. Yeah, it is psalms. I thought I had that wrong. That's right. It's one of the great servant psalms. And it's talking about this great servant of the Lord who's going to come and he's going to set everything right. And when Jesus steps on the scene and says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's beginning to preach to the poor. He's doing what this servant psalm says in Isaiah 61 says. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness to the prisoners. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vigilance of our God, and comfort to all who mourn. And he will provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of, the, of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities and have been de devastated for generations. Instead of your shame, you will receive a devil portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. There it comes again, the inheritance. And you will inherit a double portion in your land. And everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord... Love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward the people and make an everlasting covenant for them. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is claiming that psalm for himself. He's saying, I'm the one. He's saying, I am the Lord, and I have come, and I am going to restore everything. I'm going to set everything right. In other words, it's not about who you are, but about who he is. 
In other words, being lowly, being meek, means that you are powerless, that you are vulnerable. To be meek is to be human, to be inescapably fragile and vulnerable, to be powerless. And now this became a message you didn't want to hear. Because none of us want to be that. We all want to feel like we can exercise some amount of control in our lives. And that's why we get these great shows that we all love to watch, which, confession, I have not watched this yet. But Doomsday Preppers, does anybody out there watch that? You get this idea that if I do the right stuff, if I have the right things, if I have enough money, if I get it all stored up, I can keep my life, I can protect my life, I can have it all. If I just do everything right. We don't want to be fragile. We don't want to be vulnerable. And what Jesus is saying here is that there is blessing in being lowly, in recognizing that you are lowly. Because all those things that you would try to do to keep your life, they're not going to do it. One by one, they're all going to fail you. It, it brings to mind several Orange County families that I knew that looked like they had it all on the outside, and yet they're getting divorced, and even tragically, one committing suicide. They thought they had it all, and they might have just been missing the thing that they needed the most. See, there's a gift in being lowly, and the gift is that you are not capable of saving your own life. You can't do it on your own. You need someone else. And that is the real blessing in this, that Jesus comes and says, I am here for the lowly, for those who are down and out, and I'm giving your life to you as a gift. And as much as you might try to hold on to this life and think it's the best and the greatest and need to keep it, I've got something better for you. You're going to inherit the earth. And when Jesus is talking about this, he's saying, I am the end time Christ, the anointed one, the son of God. And coming onto the scene, I am going to restore everything and set everything right. And we as followers of Jesus know that that's ultimately going to happen when he comes back and returns. What Pastor Brad mentioned in his sermon last week in Revelations 21 and chapter 7 where Jesus restores everything and sets everything right. What he calls us to notice is that it's not a disembodied existence with God, but a real life, a risen life, resurrection hope for you and for me. That's what this promise is all about. It's reminding us that we can't do it on our own. And that we have a Savior and his name is Jesus. And it's not about us being able to do the right things, but rather he looks on us graciously and our lowliness gives us everything that we could ever want or need in him. That's real blessing. Blessing not based on status, but on Jesus. And then I think he's challenging us just a little bit more. He's challenging us to bring into sharp contrast the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And he's challenging our allegiance to the kingdom of this world and saying the kingdom of this world that you keep on trying to live by, it's not going to give you what you think it's going to give you. Instead, live by my kingdom. And in so doing, he's calling into question all that is worth our attention, all that is worth our respect, all that is worth our honor. He's challenging how we see literally everything in the world and asking us to reset our categories according to his kingdom rather than the kingdom of this world. He's saying that in me, this kingdom is not distant, but rather it is near it exists and it exerts influence in this world here and now and it transforms lives here and now. 
He's challenging us not to measure life by the amount of possessions or the status or the success. He's challenging us, instead of pitying losses, to enter into them with people. Instead of judging people for their failings, rather to forgive them and remind them that they are blessed by God and that they were born for more than they're settling for. He's challenging us to rather than despise weakness, to see that we are invited into it and in it see that in it is the truest morning meeting point between God's children. I'm convinced that that's where God meets us. He doesn't meet us up here on the stage. Well, he does, but he doesn't meet us when we have everything right, is what I'm trying to say. He meets us at the prayer banner. He meets us when things aren't going right. When we're hurting. And when we need him. So I mentioned that video of Elise. That was earlier, and if you watch the video closely... If you're medical, you might have known this, but uh, at that time, my daughter was showing signs uh, of a rare autoimmune disease. And at that time, we didn't know it. We didn't know what was going on, and we just thought that she was a little clumsy. But this disease attacked her skin and her muscles, and she developed what's called a myelard rash that grows across her face like a butterfly. And that disease slowly took away her strength, her ability to stand, her ability to walk, her ability to get up. And I remember the night that we said, we can't wait anymore, she's got to go to the hospital now. And with fear in my heart, sitting there wanting to be with my wife, sitting with my girls and calling a friend of the family of faith and then running over to our house so that I could be there with Lindsay and Elise. And it was in that weakness, in that desperation, in that lowly spot that I met God like never before. I met God like never before in his care and his love for me. I met God like never before in the family of faith as they gathered around and encouraged us and supported us and prayed for us. And in that weakness, I found more blessing for my life as a pastor, more blessing for my marriage, more blessing for my, my life as a father, more blessing all across the board. And it feels entirely wrong to say that, just so you know that. But it's true. Because in that moment, I learned, I learned that my life is really in the best place it can be. And that my true confidence is in the hands of the Father. And it helped to move my heart just a little bit more from the kingdom of this world to trusting in the kingdom of God. And knowing that there where he meets us, he transforms hearts and lives and changes everything. Just imagine with me for a moment. If we were truly to, to live like that, believe that, that, that Jesus meets us amid brokenness. He does. And what if our church became a place like that? That God met us in the midst of our brokenness. And just in case... You didn't get it the first time when Jesus said, don't trust the kingdom of the world. He hammers home the point in Matthew chapter 6. So I want to share this with you to, to wrap up as Jesus talks about the difference between the two kingdoms. 
No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you can't serve the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. See, our God, he reveals himself most clearly and most consistently in weakness. He meets us at the cross to give us forgiveness, to give us life, to give us the promise so that we can come there and we can see him there and we can know that no matter what, we are loved by God. So whatever is going on in your life, you can go to that cross and know that it can't be because God doesn't love you. Because he says to us, blessed are the meek. Blessed are you. You, my children, will inherit the earth. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's so hard. We want to be strong. We want to have it all together. And yet, it's in our weakness, in our vulnerableness, that you come to us with your grace, with your power, with your strength. It's in that place where you knit your family, your body together. It's where you reveal your love and your grace in our broken world. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray that your kingdom would come amongst us. That you would help us to bind up the brokenhearted, the hurting, the suffering. And Lord, as hard as it is for us to go there, as uncomfortable as it can be in those moments when we don't know what to do, help us to enter in. Help us to be there with those people with all the people that you've placed in our lives, that through us, your presence, your love, and your grace, and your power might come to them. Because, Lord, we know that we need it too. All this we pray in the saving name of Jesus. Amen.